Well, it is eight o'clock. So thank you for jumping on with us tonight. Um, I love that we get to do this to still have some sense of normalcy in our lives where we're seeing other human beings, even if it's just in this medium. Um, I'm really excited about tonight. Um, we're going to hear a story from Mandy Foster, um, just what they've experienced over the past couple of weeks. Mandy is a member of Sanctuary. She has uh, headed up mops. They're just wonderful, wonderful people. She and her husband, Justin. And um, so they have gone through it the last couple of weeks. And so I wanted her to share her story and then also talk about this practice of centering prayer that has really helped ground them over these past couple, several weeks, but it's really something that they've been doing for a really long time now. So Mandy, thank you for joining us on the eights tonight. I'm gonna see if I can unmute you. Oh, yeah. I think I unmuted myself. Hi, thanks everyone. Um, I'm really glad to be here and I have my lights on and my video on. Uh, so usually when I'm joining, I'm hiding, holding children, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so a couple weeks ago, Mandy and her husband actually had to separate physically um, because they had a bit of a scare with this whole coronavirus. So Mandy, just fill us in on um, that whole process. I know there's some really big frustrations around even testing and that whole process. So just uh, walk us through your life these last couple weeks. Yeah, so... Um... It kind of all started for us. Uh, we took spring break a week early. So before Tulsa spring break, it was the first, you know, March 8th, I think. And we went up to Colorado and, um, and we went up to Colorado from Sunday to Thursday. And then we kind of made a, um, split decision, um, last minute decision to come home. Cause my dad was having heart surgery. Um, and the heart surgery got, um, scheduled really quickly. It wasn't an emergent thing. He's actually been waiting eight years for this operation. Um, but it, it's a valve replacement. It was pretty scary. And um, we were just feeling like we needed to leave. And so an, a piece of it too was that we had some family coming in from Thailand to meet us in Colorado. And I was scared. I, she had gone through South Korea and the thought that if we come in contact with her, we might have to isolate from my father for two weeks because we could expose ourselves. Um, and it just kind of brought to light this situation with someone who had come from South Korea, kind of brought the stirring up within me of telling my husband, honestly, I don't want to be here. I want to be home in Oklahoma. So it was this, even from the start, this, um, it's kind of hidden anxiety that I had been having for weeks, probably leading up to my husband's surgery, but with the coronavirus of just the thought of one of the, my family member that I love, I don't want to see right now because her contact in the airport could risk me and my family. And it just was really disorienting um, to have those thoughts about uh, someone I love and, and feeling really actually frustrated with her for even coming to Colorado and, and making me make this decision. But all that to say is we came home, my dad got through his surgery fine, um, saw him, we were careful in the hospital, just I went up on Friday. And then on Saturday, Colorado came out with, um, if you were at, at any of the ski resorts in Summit County, you needed to self quarantine because there were so many cases that had come up. Um, and, um, so we were at those for a week straight. Um, and so on that Sunday, we self quarantined. We basically, I say self quarantine, the kids and I stayed home. My husband was just going out for essential type things for business, um, kind of real essential things. But, um, that Thursday, uh, I was taking temperatures once a day or so. Um, we were still being really cautious with my dad and hadn't seen him since that Sunday. Um, and both my husband, my son, who is four, and my daughter all had fevers within an hour of each other. Um, so we were on day five of quarantine when that happened. And to say we, it was like something just changed in our family. Um, my husband, my, 
uh, my son is four um, and he has asthma. And the reason we know he has asthma is because last May um, he got sick and he was playing on a playground and he was sick and had a fever and a cough and we didn't think much of it. And in the start of our playtime to the end of it, I, I thought he he's not breathing like he's not breathing very well it was so quick he just went from having a fever in the morning to i'm counting respiratory rates on our way home from the playground um, and that instance in last may put him into the hospital with um, pneumonia in both lungs viral bacterial the flu and what now is a diagnosis of asthma and uh, we were very close to going to the ICU multiple times. We were told three or four times that if he didn't turn around, he was going to the ICU. Um, and so that fear, um, it was a, it was like a second. I took three temperatures, took my temperature, and then Justin and I just started panicking. Um, it was this like very visceral fear. We were yelling at the kids for touching each other, for sharing things, for coughing. We were we were panicked and um and we took some breaths and calmed down just a bit um but it was really scary um and i think to just have be a mom where i my kids get fevers all the time and theo has controlled asthma that we know what to do with and it was just this really um palpable feeling of fear that i don't think either one of us had really um experience before, but we were trying to be responsible. So we started looking into testing. Um, we thought we just need to get tested. We are, we are capitulating be exposed. And so we need to start the process and that's where things kind of got frustrating. So that led us into a whole day, the next day of trying to figure out how to get tested. Um, I have doctors in my family, um, a personal friend with our, our pediatrician, no one could tell us what to do or where to go. Um, 211, I sat on the phone with them for two hours, went through three levels of screening, um, got to the last level where someone basically told me, none of you will qualify. Even your son won't qualify because you have to be 65 and in acute respiratory distress, like ready to go to the hospital. Um, and that was just really scary as a parent to know that I can't even get my child tested. Um, then they recommended that we just start calling urgent care centers. Maybe there's an urgent care center. Could even give us a direction on who to call. They don't know who has it. They hear, that literally said, I hear that there might be private testing sites, but I don't know where they are, um, which is the same thing that my doctor said. I hear some people have tests, but we don't know where they are. Um, we hear that the state might have tests, but we don't know what the qualifications were. So it's just like nobody knew anything. Um, I called around on my fourth or third or fourth urgent care center. It was the first time I explained everything that's going on, explained my son has asthma. Um, nobody is in acute distress right now, but we need to know whether or not we need to isolate right now. And we've exposed potentially 20, 30 people at this point. We need to tell those people. And uh, it was the first time someone said, I don't know what qualifications are needed. So I knew they had tests. Um, and it was like this little light of my really persevering personality to, I knew I'm going to get my child tested. And it was this fight response that I had just also never, it's like I began to understand what it was to be like someone who's stealing bread for their child or, you know, doing things where you think, I, um, it, at one point my husband even said, you know what, Mandy, if like, if there is one ventilator left, I would fight for my family to have that ventilator. Um, and I don't care who would get hurt in the process. It was like those kind of conversations that you just think, what world are we in right now? Where like, I am literally like begging for a test. Um, so anyway, we, we qualified. I didn't have to beg. Um, he had asthma. They had a test. They had his medical records from St. Francis. And so um, we went through the super secret protocol that you had to go through, the super secret location and the very specific instructions that you had to do. And we went and got tested. And um, I drove home and I got out of the car and I thought, okay, what do we do now? Because what we have this child, we have one of us is the only one that qualified for a test. And I walked in the door and my husband panicked and he said, you can't come in this house because you'll, you'll contaminate Theo's test basically. 
And it was again, this response of just like panicked fear of like, if you, you just step foot in this house, you, you've ruined the whole thing. Kind of this just big responses that we're just not used to as a couple or, um, not being calm is just not something I'm, I'm an eight, so I'm not calm usually ever, but, um, <laughs> um, it just, it was surreal. And so we didn't, we stayed in the car. My husband packed us up, um, packed toys, packed all of his med medicines, his emergency meds, his steroids, everything we could think of. He packed and, um, Theo and I went up to my parents' lake house or houseboat. And we thought it would be a couple days and then we'll come together as a family. By Monday, we'll have the test. They said it was two days. And um, 12 days later, 11 days, um, is when finally um, Justin ended up going and just paying. They had come out. Um, again, every single day I was calling. Every day, nobody knew where the tests were. Every day. There were no answers every day. I was talking to pulmonologist, to nurses, to um, two on one call line people, to the Warren Clinic call people. They all said the same things, which is we don't know. And then this is everybody's story right now. Um, no one's telling us anything. We know they're in Utah. That's it. Um, or uh, we're so sorry. We hear there's faster testing, but we don't know where it is. Um, or towards the end of our stay was, we know the hospital has faster testing, but you have to be inpatient or doctor for it. And it just was over and over until the end. Basically in those last couple of days, it was um, let people know, like let, I, at one point, I just wanted to let them know, I'm so sorry, I know this isn't your fault. And she said, I know, but you could tell, you could tell your representatives, like they were asking me to advocate for them. Um, you could tell the governor, you can tell the people in charge that this is what it's like. Um, and I just, it just was such a sense of helplessness, not for just myself, but for everyone involved. Um, our doctor was calling us every night. And during that time, my husband and my daughter and my baby were sick. They were, they were very sick. Um, and Justin couldn't move. He had muscle aches. They all had fevers. They had coughs. Um, my doctor was calling us every night when she had put her kids to bed, was texting me at 10 o'clock at night to check in on their symptoms. Um, or basically going forward, like we need to just assume that you guys have it. And Justin was here all by himself, taking care of kids. I kept telling him over and over, I I've never done what you're doing. Like I've never taken care of a baby sick with no help before ever in my life. And I've definitely never done that for 10, 11 days. Um, so that's our story. I mean, Justin ended up, they came out with faster testing, really expensive faster testing. And we were like the third people in line for it. Um, we had Justin tested and within 36 hours got his test back that they were negative. And by that point, um, Theo and I were 12 days out. And so without Theo's test, our doctor felt like even if he was positive, we were 12 days past and Theo was healthy and he was not showing any symptoms of anything. He had a little fever and a cough and those went away within the first couple days with his asthma protocol. Um, everyone else was fever free for four or five days. And with Justin's negative test, they just felt really comfortable with us going home, but we were going home without an answer. Uh, we still didn't know. So we still came home, we still isolated, we didn't see anyone. Um, and then we didn't get the test back until Friday, which was 14 days later. So uh, that's a bit of our story. Um, and Nobody, that, test, that test was negative, Mindy? That test was negative, too, yeah. And by that time, literally got a text from our doctor that says, I know this isn't a surprise at this point, but the test is negative. So um, we just were able to see my parents. And we, my parents, uh, we all live in the same property. We live next door to each other. We share a farm together. So we kind of consider ourselves one family unit. Um, so we were able to see them, and um, have been that has been good for us. and. Um, anyway, that's kind of our story. We're all healthy now. Um, but again, we're just, um, we don't ever want to have to do that again. So we're super cautious, of course, but I think the thing that I think why maybe Paul wanted me to talk to and talk about centering prayer was just this, um, 
I think the things that were most remarkable in noticing is just how quick fear crept in, but that fear didn't look like fear. It looked like anger. Um, it, it looked just like anger, anger at our kids for doing things they do all the time, touch their face. I don't know. I mean, it was like a fever broke and we were like, don't touch your face, screaming at our children who are four, and three things that were just like, when you consciously think about it, you would think that's just a silly reaction or anger at, um, at just people we're working with or at the doctor or, um, as why a pretty upwardly mobile white family, like that piece of like, why can't I get what I want? And that was probably the piece that hit us the most is that this feeling of like, I deserve to know, um, when that's just not a true thing. That's not true at all. Um, and so I think it just really stirred. It was really disorienting for us and finding rhythms of things that helped was really important. And I think almost now, I don't think we had great rhythms necessarily during the crisis, but now of like debriefing from it. And I've stated, like, I feel like I still have this weight on my chest of like, going through the anxiousness of being helpless um, and how I don't like being helpless um, at all and what God is kind of teaching us through helplessness. Yeah, that's really good, Mandy. Um, I think one of the things that so many people are experiencing right now is the ways in which this illusion of control is, is being ripped away from us. And I think your whole experience, especially speaking to like losing your temper with your kids and all of a sudden seeing like so much fear and anger and all these things creep in, so much of it has to do with realizing that we have so little control over our lives and over our situation and how much trust and patience a lot of that takes. Um, I don't know that most people that are on this call would be familiar with the practice of centering prayer. And yeah. I know this has been really integral to your spirituality and Justin's spirituality for the last several years. Um, can you give us like a brief sort of intro into what is centering prayer? How do you do it? And why do you think it's been uh, so meaningful for you guys? Yeah, I, uh, first of all, I would say centering prayer kind of is housed under this larger umbrella of contemplative practices. Um, and uh, contemplative practices include things like centering prayer, um, but also things like breath prayers or the serenity prayer or labyrinth blocks. They're this way to kind of experience God in a um, very what, mystic Christians. Um, uh, would really think about as ways to connecting with God through our body and mind and spirit. Um, and um, I have really, I think, changed way before the, we even found centering prayer, just contemplative practices and, and have changed the way that Justin and I engaged the world. Um, and we really learned a lot because we were pretty strong advocates for people who are in marginal spaces. And we were butting up with these ideas of being activists and um, being with people in the margins of life where literally there was nothing to do. There was nothing I could do to help. Um, and, and, and we're working alongside a group of people who realize that in your disorientation, in your helplessness, in your, um, paradigm shifts about life, that the way that that can be handled the most is in these practices that allow you three things, which is definitely um, solitude, stillness, and silence. And that's what contemplative prayer does, is it allows us um, solitude, stillness, and silence. And I don't do well with those. I'm a very extroverted person. Um, and uh, I I had never ever practiced stillness before, quiet before. Um, and so the overarching contemplative prayers really allowed that, those, those spaces. Um, it wasn't until Justin and I met and started really engaging some of those practices that we um, ran into 
the contemplative, I mean, the centering prayer. And the centering prayer is most like what you would think of as meditation. Um, I think the idea of centering prayer is to empty yourself, to literally think of nothing. Um, the kind of fathers of contemplative prayer would say, um, if God himself comes to you in your quietness, you let it go. Uh, that, that the idea isn't that you are trying to hear from God or see something or empty your, yourself so that you have this experience. It is literally an act of emptying. It is letting go of everything. Um, and in that complete letting go of thinking of nothing, of, of letting go of your thoughts, of letting go of your body, of being still and quiet, um, that is the space in which we meet God. Um, in his essence and his presence. Um, and the, the piece about centering prayer for me, definitely in this time, is that um, people who firmly believe in centering prayer and these kind of mystic practices would say that it's, it's how, it's the best way to engage. Like we are, are in our centering prayer, kind of like fighting for humanity. It's the thing that we can do um, to, to kind of save us all. Um, and I have some writings of Thomas Keating, but that's um, kind of the father of centering prayer, but that's what it is. It's meditation. It's emptying your mind. It's thinking of nothing. Um, and in, in the act of centering prayer, they tell you to kind of get into a, a quiet place. Actually, you can see our spot here. Little... We have our little spot here where we sit on our little pillow and then we have a candle that we light <laughs> um, and a little gong. We're big nerds. Um, and um, you get in a comfortable space and you think of a word or a symbol and that grounding symbol is something that you're supposed to come back to because the idea is that you can't empty your mind for long. And honestly, man, I'm a, a good centering prayer day. I have a good 40 seconds, I feel like, before a thought comes into my mind. Um, but the idea is that when the thought comes, you let it go. Some people talk about um, imagining yourself like you're on a river and your thoughts are the leaves that are coming down the river and you let them pass by you and you grab onto nothing. Um, some people talk about uh, thinking like you are literally sinking, weighted to the bottom of a river. and and as you get deeper and deeper, the light from the top is, gets further and further away. And when you feel yourself coming up, you tell yourself to go down deeper. That one scares me to death sometimes. Because I think that idea of like going underwater is the scariest part of faith, right? Um, but that's the idea of centering prayer is to hold on to nothing. Um, and in that nothingness, you are still in the presence of God. And I'm sure... Uh, Others might have other ways to explain it, but that's the, the way I explain it, so. Oh, and I might have my husband who's gonna come talk as well. Maybe not. <laughs> so I would say that um, is the idea of centering prayer. And I think um, we, here's Justin. Hello. <laughs> um, and I would say for us, um, it really is a practice. And I think in this season of helplessness, uh, when I was away, when it was just me and my son, the practice was easier. Whereas when we're here at home, the practice is pretty hard for me because there's a lot that goes along. And I, um, it's hard for me to be still and to, to take the time um, and the practice to do it. Um, but I think in this season, that's what I've been thinking is that um, the world depends on me doing this. That's how like, um, that's how I kind of combat my helplessness is that this is, this is how the world feels. This is, I'm doing this for humanity, not just for myself. You know? Yeah, that's beautiful. You know, Mandy, one of the things that I was thinking about as you were kind of explaining how we we enter into these practices um is how it's almost like the the more nothing you can do the more impactful um these centering prayers can be 
and that's so counterintuitive to us, right? I think most of us feel like to have a good prayer experience, we have to bring a lot of emotion. We have to bring a lot of the right words and a lot of the right feelings to the moment. And depending on whether or not we do that, you know, we consider like, oh man, I had a really great time in prayer. And here this practice is really coming and bringing nothing and um, offering nothing and trying to empty yourself and letting God fill up all that emptiness in us. Um, Justin, really good to see you, man. I'm glad you're feeling better. Uh, yeah, did thanks. you have anything you wanted to, to add? Yeah, sorry to uh, just barge in like this. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, the, the centering prayer process is, is all about taking away um, and doing that quickly. Um, and so I just, no, it, I just, in my experience, um, I mean, it is a method of like meditation. So, I mean, if, if folks who are on this call, um, have tried to meditate and have a hard time with doing that, it's very rooted in the Christian tradition. And so I'd encourage you to, you know, kind of dive into it. Um, but more, more than a, a meditation, it's very Christian in the sense that it's, it's hard is about surrender. Um, and, and this in a very, you know, uh, apophatic way. And so there's no, there's no, yeah, it's a very much a stripping away of what Father Thomas Keating calls all of our programs for happiness. Um, and, and we all have those. And so um, he talks about it as a uh, sort of this divine therapy. And um, in my life, and, and I think in a lot of our lives, that we, we all could use some of that, um, where it's sort of just like this shortcut, the shortcut into communion with God in a way that you can't find with um, other practices, frankly. Um, and so um, the idea is that the centering prayer as a method would lead to contemplative prayer. And it doesn't always happen that way. Because I mean, contemplative prayer is just a gift and a grace. But it is a very fast way to get there. Um, so there's a pragmatism to it on the one hand, and then there's sort of this mysticism to it on the other hand. And I think the practice holds both of those pretty beautifully. Um, and it sucks. <laughs> and so if you want to do it, really try to do it, like try to do 20 minutes oh. um, and then commit for like at least a month and maybe walk with other people that are doing it too. Because there's a lot of suckage <laughs> just to the whole thing. Um, but, but it's manifested just in the fruit of your life. You know what I mean? It's not, it's a miserable process, but um, the fruit of your life is just kind of where, where it comes out. You know what I mean? That's benefits. Can I, can I, we're kind of out of time here. The, guys, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to put a note in for those of you that are, that have any roots in Pentecostalism, you'll remember if you've read anything from the early years of Pentecostalism, they would talk about this idea of praying in tongues and would highlight how it wasn't something of the mind Paul talks about when you pray in tongues or pray in the spirit, that your mind is unfruitful and that your spirit is praying. And even though some people got very emotional about it, there was a, in the early literature, there's people just committed to praying in tongues without any emotion attached to it. And as they prayed, they talk about moments when they would pray through. And the way that they described it is often what I've heard in the centering prayer context. And early on in my spiritual experience, because praying in the spirit isn't a, um, is your mind's not engaged with it. It's something that is more of a pouring out of your, of your heart and would have described those moments. And, and, and most people would, they would call it breaking through, which oftentimes I used to pray in, in tongues for, for hours 
and uh, and at some point as I was entering in there, there's no conscious kind of mind engagement. I'm just adoring and opening up. So I, I do think that that maybe those of you that have um, that your prayer language, this might be something. It's almost like a chant, right, in some way, um, or a focus point, like you were saying, Mandy. They'll they'll talk about a centering prayer, thinking of an object or some kind of centering point. Uh, there in the tradition, it's 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 also this kind of expression is done in that way. But anyway, that might be a little more familiar to people. I know we have, we're almost done, but I just have this real short thing from Father Keating, who was kind of the guru of centering prayer and contemplative prayer that I thought I would read. It says, the contemplative journey is the most responsible of all responses to God because so much depends on it. The future of humanity, the healing of the wounds of humanity to our own deepest healing. It's not just a method of meditation or practice to find personal peace. It's basically a total acceptance of the human condition in all its ramifications, including its desperate woundedness. Humans are fully capable of becoming God, not in the fullest sense of the term, but in a very real way where the light, life, and love of God are pouring through them, channeling a source of healing, compassion, and reconciliation wherever they go and whatever they do. They are rooted in the divine compassion and mercy and are manifesting the pure light of the image of the likeness of God within them, which is the assimilation of the mind and the heart of Christ in everyday life. So. Really nice. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we are out of time. Mandy, real quick, where would you guys send people if people were interested in learning a little bit more about this? I, would, I think the just the, the Bible to the practice is uh, the divine therapy by Thomas Keating. Very very practical, very to the point. And I would start there as, as a resource. Uh, read that book, um, The Divine Therapy. Um, the, the Cloud of Unknowing is where it comes from. Um, if you wanted to get into the history, that's by an anonymous author, author that actually wrote that book during the plague. Um, so that might be an interesting read right now, but, but it's very accessible in The Divine Therapy by Keating. And then uh, Contemplative Outreach is the organization that has a lot of resources as well around it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for that. And thank you all for joining us in our conversation tonight. Um, we hope you will join us for morning prayer tomorrow morning on the 8th. And uh, know that we are praying for you. We're with you. And uh, we hope to see you on the 8th next time. Thank you. Grace, peace.